Hello, I'm Leroy Garcia, and this is Blue Rain Gallery Podcast. Today in the studio, uh, we are interviewing one of my favorite people in life, uh, our executive director, Denise Fetterplace. Welcome. Thank you, Leroy. <laughs> it's about time you had me on a podcast. I know. <laughs> Den- Denise has had a wonderful journey with me in Blue Rain um, for close to 20 years. I know. Very blessed to have her in our lives. Um, I brought her in today because we're going to be talking about, uh, I get teary eyed, sorry. We're going to be talking about a a concept that she came up with a few years ago that deals with um, paying tribute to the Taos founders of the Art Society of Taos. And um, I thought it was a genius idea. And we'll let her talk a little bit about where she developed the idea and uh, the impact it's had on, on the artists that we represent. Denise, tell us where you're from before that and, and a little bit about your journey, who you are. Where I'm from, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, originally from Wakefield, Rhode Island. Uh, I spent a handful of years in Vermont where I was in school. Uh, I moved west after that and um, New Mexico uh, captured my Heart, like it did for most people, um, particularly for many of these uh, famous painters that we're about to discuss. So I never left. <laughs> <laughs> I, I met you um, almost 20 years ago, and um, it's been um, it's been a great journey with Blue Rain. Um, so that's sort of my story in a nutshell. Yeah, oh, right on. Well, let's get down to the concept and go from there. Where'd you develop the idea? Where'd you get this idea from? Well. Um, Taos and Santa Fe have always been touted as a art destination. Um, We're a bit of an art mecca, and a lot of that reputation is due largely to um, the Taos founding artists. Um, There were six of them. Um, And, you know, if it were not for those very special histories, uh, I don't know that Taos and Santa Fe would have the same sort of clout that it has on an, an international scale in, in terms of being an art market. It sort of paved the way. It sure did. And, you know, and, and as uh, gallerists and art dealers, um, we, we reap the benefits of that. Yes, we do. Um, for those of you uh, who are watching these podcasts, um, if you're unaware, Blue Rain Gallery started in Taos. Um, Taos is my homeland, and that's where uh, I started the, the Blue Rain Gallery. Um, over the course of uh, many years, uh, our gallery was in Taos for about 15 to 17 years, I forget, probably around 17. Uh, we had the wonderful opportunity of being visited on a regular basis by um, Irving Kaus's granddaughter, Jeannie, and her husband, Ernie. And uh, they had a great appreciation for art. And um, they preserved uh, the original house of Irving Kaus and the Joseph Henry Sharp Studio, which has now become a foundation, a historic foundation. And that was created in 2001. But we're going to talk a little bit about the three... Uh, the three um, artists that we have already recognized, with one about to be recognized in the end of April. This show opens up on April uh, 29th, and it'll run for a couple of weeks. But let's start with the first artist we recognized in Oscar Burning House. What, what did you like about that show and, and how the artists interpret it? I was really impressed. Um, it was really, for me, it was, um, it was really exciting to see our artists um, take to the challenge of painting something that was perhaps unfamiliar to them or just out of their uh, their box aesthetically. Um, I really appreciated the effort that each of our artists put in and their attempt to honor one of Oscar Burninghouse's original paintings, but still give it their own sort of um, stamp. They really, they really put their own style into it, many of them. Uh, I was very impressed. Yeah, uh, I hung a, one of those pieces from the first show, which was really um, to the point, uh, by Delali Almeida. And that's a 
behind me to the left of me. That's such a great painting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he really contemporized it with this album. It, we, we, it's a beautiful painting. And, uh, but all of these artists uh, kind of did their own spin and, and take. It was nice to see them stretch themselves. And then, um, then the next show was on Joseph Henry Sharp. And we saw the same type of thing happen. And um, I hung a painting on the right side of me uh, that Doug West did. And uh, I don't know if you remember, how did Doug West feel about doing that painting? That was the first time Doug West had ever painted a figure. I think he did amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think he did amazing. Um, and even though that's clearly Taos Mountain in the background, um, the the feel of the um, of the the native peoples that are behind him uh, kind of are reminiscent of um, of some of those Blackfoot scenes that Joseph Henry Sharp did. Uh, it sort of evokes a little bit of that. Um, I think Doug did a beautiful job. I, I mean, he's one of those artists that really took to the challenge well. He did. He did. I was surprised at how nice that came out to you because <laughs> his style is mostly point, uh, pointillistic. And there's a lot of pointillism in that. A lot of effort uh, went into that. A lot of thought. And um, we're proud of our artists for participating in this. Um, the next artist that we're covering uh, this April is Irving Kaus. And uh, like I said, we have a lot long standing history with the family. Um, I remember going to uh, Joseph Henry Sharp's studio because we used to represent an, an artist in that, Randy Legros who painted in that studio for many years. And so it was kind of always stepping back into history, uh, going back into those homes. I mean, do you remember going through some of those tours? I, I loved visiting Randy's studio. That was um, a beautiful experience. Yeah, and then Ginny and Ernie invited us once or twice into the, the Cow's home as well. Do you remember doing that at all? I don't know that I had a chance to do one of those tours with um, Ginny and Ernie, um, yeah. but they they kind of kept it exactly like it, it was like the artist just left even though he's been gone for 70 plus years or so um very interesting what can we what can we talk about as far as the uh, history of mr kaus in coming to taos well he first came to taos in i believe it was 1902 um he grew up in saginaw michigan uh received a formal art training the Art Institute, the Art Institute of Chicago, um, the Academy of Design in New York, um, later the Academy Julian in Paris. Um, he met his wife in Paris, and uh, they or her family had a farm uh, property in the state of Washington. So, um, so they spent some time um, on that property uh, together, which actually gave um, gave Kaus an opportunity to to really begin painting um, native subject matter. Uh, he had a chance to uh, interact with and paint uh, the, I believe it was the Klickitat and Umatia tribes, um, always with incredible reverence. Um, and growing up as a young boy, I believe he was um, situated quite close to the Chippewas, so that sort of sparked an early interest in um, Native American culture um, in him. So, you know, it was something that he had always wanted to explore, I think, in his work. Yeah. Well, what we were talking about in the beginning is like, what what was the impact of, why were, why were these artists coming to, all the way to Taos? And the and I was reading up a little bit, and it, it makes sense. Uh, at that time period, um, there was westward expansion, but it wasn't, the, the southwest over here was pretty much untouched from that expansion or the manifest destiny at that time. And uh, so it was like a pristine environment that was kind of untouched in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty cool, because it seems like the same thing with your journey a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate, and I, was, I never knew the difference, but I see people who come in, in the Southwest, particularly Taos Santa Fe, has a, a unique draw to it. What are some of those draws other than the culture that they may have liked? Uh, well, for, for the painters in particular, I think it was the light. You know, you always hear the light being talked about 
here in New Mexico and in Taos in particular. Um, and it just attracted, I think, a lot of creatives at the time, not just painters, but, uh, but writers and independent thinkers. Um, and, you know, for anybody that just wanted to enjoy the beauty of the outdoors, even at that time, um, it was, as you say, pristine, untouched. Um, and it created a lot of opportunity for, for painting. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I think for all of these painters, really, that we're discussing, they, um, they had a real appreciation and um, reverence for the subjects that they were painting. They, they wanted to portray them um, in the most um, authentic light. Um, they wanted to honor them. Um, I, I know Kaus sought to do that in his work as did sharp they seem like they had a like a, a reverence for the native peoples especially in that area and uh, uh what else was interesting about uh, sharp was he was the first president of what oh the Tao society of artists uh -huh. yeah he was, he the was first their first president yeah that was pretty cool and so they recognized the fact that they needed to create maybe a society because they all had, loved the same things in essence well, it allowed them to push each other, um, mm -hmm. to to challenge each other. To um, they were stronger as a group than they were as individuals. Um, Kaus got a lot of recognition in his career for some of the paintings he did for the Santa Fe Railways uh, calendar series. Um, you know, he's he's certainly known for having done that work. Um, there's a foundation set up for him in Taos. Um, yes, he's certainly left his mark here in the Southwest. He left a mark in uh, that, that view why people still come here because he created that romantic vision of what the westward expansion into the Southwest was. And maybe for some reason they helped draw this into the territories <laughs> in a way, you know, bringing attention. Uh, but they did it in a reverence uh, for the, the native peoples especially. Um, and as we sit here and we kind of reminisce on them too, um, as gallerists who've been in this business for a long time, um, there's a magic mm -hmm. um, about it for us. For sure, for sure. Um, behind uh, Denise over here are two paintings, uh, one by Dennis Siminski and the other uh, by Matthew Sievers, and two distinct different styles. But uh, they, they've seemed to capture that same reverence. I'm really looking forward they to seeing more of this imagery. Um, one of his most famous paintings uh, was The Captive. And, and that's kind of interesting. When we're going to release a podcast with Andrea Peterson, who used that as reference material, but reinterpreted it in a really different way. <laughs> well, and the interesting thing about her choice, too, was that, that that was not a typical painting for him. I mean, that was really his first the first public painting that he ever did um, of um, Native American subject matter, and it was um, it was a more tragic scene. It wasn't really it wasn't representative of his overall style. So, um, but I really like what she what she did with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll have to. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> I'm really excited to see this show. Um, like to encourage everybody to come on and visit. We'll also have everything online as soon as we get it. And uh, we're going to try to release some more podcasts with some of the artists in interview format to explain what they like about the pieces they chose um, to paint and um, the reverence they have for that artist in particular as well. So thank you, Denise, for stopping by today, even though you're right next door. <laughs> That's it? So painless. I know. <laughs> you put too much pressure on yourself. <laughs> like to encourage everybody to subscribe to our podcast. Uh, visit us on YouTube or any of the platforms, including our website under the podcast menu bar. Um, we'd also like to encourage everybody to take art with you into your everyday life by going to Blue Ring Gallery or BlueRingPrintShop.com. Thanks, Denise. Thank you, Lee <laughs>